All right, a happy Friday to you and yours, but an apology right off the top because I went almost a whole week without a podcast and then didn't even acknowledge it last Wednesday with WEI's Andy Hart. So apologies there. We are going to aim to get back to our regular Tuesday, Friday schedule here on Pat's Interference. And as we do that, uh, I will also acknowledge we will have mailbag answers at the end of this episode, which I asked for on Tuesday and then also kind of ignored you for a few days. But uh, we had a big breaking story that tends to upend anyone who covers the Patriots. By now, you're used to it. But even when the coach is gone, even when the owner you think is done speaking, uh, no, they're not done. No, they're not done speaking. And so uh, before we dive in here with Alex Barth of 98.5 The Sports Hub, I also want to say thank you to everyone who attended last night's Patriots draft party at Vitamin C Brewing. We raised over $8,000 for Boston Children's Hospital. It was me, Fitzy, Doug Codd, Phil Perry, Jeff Howe, uh, Bob Sosi, Alex was there. We had Taylor Kyles came out, John Lyons, Nick Cattles, like it was uh, a great night, a lot of laughs. Fitzy was was on an absolute tear. Uh, he was great. It was, yeah, we're, we're going to do that again. Like, that's 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 the best part about this. I think we might have a, a bi- biannual tradition. So, as I mentioned, Alex Barth is now with us. Uh, second time here on the podcast. Around the same time last year, you were on 98 by the Sports Hub. You were on the yeah. Catch-22 show with the Patriots, uh, Patriots.com and other places. You were yeah. often back here on the CLNS platforms. In a way that if you were an ex SNL cast member, I think you would have not just a five time host, uh, you know, robe or whatever bit they did a couple of weeks ago, uh, but you would be 10, 15, something, 20 times. So I just I have one question because yeah. you, you very casually dropped that last night when I saw you at the, at the event. I think I'm doing three shows today. You might have already done three shows before you this came is on. Three of three. Today. Yeah. Yeah. What is your battery level? I need a percentage right now from Alex Barth before we're even at noon on Friday, April 19th. I'm feeling good. Look, I'm feeling good. And I've been That's not a like allergies I need, all week too. I need a number. 98, 98%. Wow. I'm ready to go. Here's that you have no option this time of year, right? This is it. This is the draft. This is, you know, it, pull me out of the supply closet for three weeks. Everybody wants a piece of me. And then, you know, come Sunday, I'll, I'll see everybody again in 10 months, right? So, um, you know, the adrenaline, all of it, it's just a fun time here. I'm not missing this for anything. I have plenty of time to sleep in the off season. Um, I'm feeling good. I appreciate you having me. I've been looking forward to this one. And uh, yeah, I'm no chance I wasn't getting up for this one. Okay. Uh, first of all, you were a liar. You were not at 98%. I could see it on your face. <laughs> but I, I know I know the I should have said 98.5. I should have been for the brand. There you go. Yeah. That uh, If we had a penalty box, I might have sent you for 30 yeah. seconds, even if only just to rest <laughs> here in the podcast. But look, first of all, uh, what you said diminishes your work year round, which is you, you grind. And I, I'm going to say this in a way that might make you uncomfortable, but it's honest. Uh, you work as hard as anyone on the beat. And this is not a Belichickian kind of cliche compliment. That, that's absolutely true. You can follow Alex for Celtic stuff, for Bruins stuff, for Patriots stuff. You were there. You were at the press conference in the locker room, uh, not just in the supply closet when we pull you out and need to do some NFL draft spring cleaning. And so, yes, I do have you on the podcast for the draft because your passion is what sustains you here. Midday Friday when you've yeah. done a billion shows, you've had markers thrown at you or in your vicinity with the, the big board and the Felger mess. Um, and we are going to talk about the draft here today because of the way that you grind, the way that you care about this, yeah. uh, and the way that that merges into some very, very good content and thoughtful analysis on your part. That being said, we are going to start uh, with a silly little game. <laughs> it is not right. serious. And I told you a little bit about this before we started recording, and yeah. I mentioned it in my rundown. This is the Belichick family guessing game. And I am not kidding when I say that. This is an actual game played by Stephen Bryan. Uh, Steve, now the defensive coordinator in Washington, Brian still the safety coach for the Patriots. Everyone knows Bill. When in the early 90s, Bill was the head coach of the Browns, and they all lived in Cleveland and would take these family trips south down to Kenton to obviously visit the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So as Steve opened up to me on media night for Super Bowl 53, so going back February 2019 or late January, yep. he was telling me about this game where Steve and Brian would sit in the backseat of the car. They've had all of these football cards, hundreds and hundreds between them. And as they're driving to kill the time, they would pick one up and they would read to Bill in the front seat (laughs) a player's height, his weight, his college, his position, and draft class. And Bill, knowing that these cards spanned years and years and years, had to name the player. So we are going to play a version of this Belichick family guessing game with Alex Barth. Now, great. I can, the draft class is obvious. It's 2024. Okay. Yeah. Like this, this would, I would be very exceptionally cruel if I just pulled out prospects from other classes and had you guess uh as i say we do this in 2024 i have three players i think yeah. you can get at least two of them you might even get three there okay. uh, but i'm not going to give you the draft class and i'm not going to give you the position i will give you the position if you don't get it initially 
Okay. And we'll see how you do. These are not, All I right. will say, UDFAs. They're not seventh round picks. They're not sixth round okay. picks. Okay. This is my trust in you to show the people you know your stuff. All right. No pressure. Let's do it. All right. Ready? Do, do, and the no pressure. Are high. All right. There's, All there's, right. The, the Steve and Brian, uh, actually, I actually didn't talk to Brian for the story, but Steve was saying the stakes were very high. Dad yeah. hated to lose. And there's no word if Steve had to grow out his hair because he lost this game himself. But we'll, we will dig into that a little bit later. All right. All right. First off the top, I have three prospects, and then we'll get to your draft crushes and then uh, pick players cool. we think the Patriots are going to take. All right. Six foot one. Yep. 197 pounds. Yep. University of Washington. Six foot one, 197 pounds, University of Washington. They have so wow, they have so many guys. That's what makes this tough. They got all these receivers. They've got some defensive backs. Um talk it out. Take your time. Right. So so it's not Michael Penix. He's bigger than that. It's not Roma Dunze. He's bigger than that. I instantly go to Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk, and Dominique Hampson, who's the safety, who's not getting talked about as much. Um, I think Polk's a little taller than that. I think Polk's like six two. Um and I, you said one, 197, 197. Washington. It's not, it's not Dylan Johnson. It's obviously not an alignment. I, well, you said no six or seventh round pick. Hampson's projected to go, I think, a little lower than that. So I'm going to go Jalen McMillan. Well done, sir. All right. This is me clapping far away from the mic. That might be too loud for the folks who just listened to that. But I will tell you, you are one for one. Uh, All right. My, my, my next stat was going to be the 40 time. Jalen McMillan, I think, is a player that should be on uh, Patriots fans' radar. So yes. I think he played a little bit more in the slot, uh, which to me, you look at just their depth to our big slots, little slots. Patriots have enough of those. Okay. They've got enough Z guys. They're looking for a big X. Yeah. I'm not as confident in his ability to play, um, you know, X alone, but tell us a little bit about Jalen McMillan. Yeah. I, so he, they, they had three guys at Washington and it, it makes it really easy. To, the way they used them all makes it easier to understand them individually. You had Roma Dunze, who was your true one, one coverage dictator. You had Jalen Polk, who I've compared to like a slightly more explosive Jacoby Myers, where he was kind of the chain mover. And then you had McMillan was the go ball guy. So when they would run, you know, teams are coming up on Polk, taking him away at the sticks. When teams would start shading too much over the top to Roma Dunze, Jalen McMillan's the guy who's going vertical a lot from the slot and, and kind of grabbing that. So I, there's definitely a role for that in the Patriots offense, uh, in the Van Pelt offense, especially if they draft a guy like Jane Daniels, who excels with that kind of receiver, like you try to pair these guys together, he'd be an interesting pick. So yeah, I, I definitely think he belongs on the Patriots radar. And so I will add to that in a, in a big picture sense, right? You mentioned yeah. the, the kind of go balls, the fades with Jane Daniels yeah. did excel at. And, and someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, and I just missed it because I was saying, look, if you draft a quarterback, you can't draft around a skill set immediately. Like you're taking someone you trust at three who can do everything. Obviously right. he'll have strengths, weaknesses he needs to address. But when you talk about those type of routes, first of all, McMillan was great on them. And that was a great breakdown by yeah. you. I would say that the slot fade has been in vogue the last few years, which coincided with this wave of single high coverage, right? This is third down. The goal of the slot fade is to ensure that you get a one-on-one -on -one matchup because you're in the, you're in the slot and steering yourself towards the sideline to get a window where only you can get it because you're going away from the single high safety. As we've right. seen more two high structures, though, that route just steers right into one of the two safeties and right. is a little bit less useful, which is not to diminish Jalen McMillan as a prospect. It's just to say that as the game evolves, the best players have to do that along with them. And because of the advantages he had from a matchup standpoint, working with the Dunze and Polk, it makes me wonder a little bit. And I think this is reflected in his grade as like a third or fourth round guy. Um, that he'll have to adjust maybe sooner rather than later. Yeah, I would say my my big knock on him is growing off of that. So I think a lot of guys you look at in the draft have one or two routes that they're outstanding at. And in college, you can win on one or two. In the NFL, it becomes about, can you set up that one route and then break things off of it? So if you're a good slant fade guy, turning that into a dig or even a slant, or not slant fade, slot fade, turning that into a dig or even a slant, like the setup's going to be the same. And then it's it's breaking off of that where you start leaving the cornerback guessing. So McMillan didn't have to do a ton of that at Washington because the offense was so well-rounded. Well and also because even against cover two, Michael Penix has the deep ball accuracy to put it right on his hands. But in the NFL, I think that's going to be the big what if. Like if they draft him, it's like, all right, they got this guy with speed. They got this guy with vertical ability. 
Well, they already have that. It's Tyquan Thornton. The thing Tyquan Thornton never did or hasn't done to this point is teams don't respect him underneath. So they'll give him that cushion and let him run to them because they're like, go ahead, run a slant, run it in. Yeah. Like we dare you. That's what McMillan. And I don't think McMillan's same as, is Tyquan. He's much more nimble. He's much more agile, but it's going to be that same sort of process of, okay, teams are going to give him all that cushion. Can he develop a secondary route, tertiary route to take advantage of that? It's tough, man. This is why you're on 98%. Maybe you can, uh, you're starting to sway me a little bit. I told okay, you. Player, player number two. Six yep. three, okay. Two fifty one, University of Alabama. Six three, two fifty one, University of Alabama. All right. Um, Alabama is like no offensive players in this draft, which is super weird. People say, "Why aren't we talking more about Alabama?" Is it because Bill's gone? No, it's because the Patriots don't need defense in their entire draft this year, outside of like J.C. Latham as defense and Jermaine Burton, who won is much smaller and two. I don't think the Patriots will draft. Um, it's got to be Braswell, right? Because you're not going to put Will. I don't think you'd put Will Anderson on here because we're talking about Patriots prospects, right? Um, could be any prospect. And oh, could be. Mm, well, not necessarily I, Patriots fit. So just guys in the. Okay, draft. I do think Anderson's bigger than that. Justin Egabogi's bigger. He's a defensive lineman. Um, they don't really have Will Reichert's not that kind of tank. Um, uh, I'm going to say Chris Braswell. Yeah, two for two. My All guy. Right. All right. All now, right. granted, these are uh, these are bigger schools, but as I was yep. trying to make my list, you know, you have the small school guys stand out, right? Again, I'm not going sixth, seventh round here on you. We want to build up your credibility. Right. I'm rooting for you, even if I'm applying the pressure. <laughs> well, and the so, small school would be easier too. Like if you tell right. me Houston Christian, it's Jalex Hunt. I know that. Like there's not that deep of a pool. So yeah, or British Columbia might be a little bit of a tip off as we go into a big Giovanni Manu, Manu, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Six two, two forty one. Florida State. Six two two four. All right, so it's too small to be jo uh, Johnny Wilson. Six two two forty one. Florida State versus bigger than that. It's not Braden Fisk. Brandon Coleman didn't get to two forty one. No way. I don't think Trey Benson's that big. Oh, it's Jaheim Bell. Yes, nailed it. Okay, three yeah. Three. Tell us about Jaheim Bell. Jaheim Bell is really fascinating because we talk about players that maybe have more distance on different teams' boards than others, right? There's not a lot of consensus. And sometimes oh, let me that's stop just you for a second because I did yeah. a bad job on the front end. Braswell is an edge rusher. Oh, Braswell. Yep. Jaheim Bell is an undersized tight end at a Florida State expected to go fourth yeah. or fifth round. Continue. So I'll even just say on Braswell, should be a top 50 pick. I don't think the Patriots should be taking an edge guy in the top 50. Good player, but. Well, what I always say about those guys is we'll revisit that in four years when he's a free agent um, on, on bell. It's not even that teams are going to disagree on the skill set. I don't think teams are going to decide are going to be the same on what position he plays. Like he played tight end at Florida state, but he lined up everywhere. Is he a big slot receiver? Is he a move tight end? Do you, you know, try to work with him as a blocker, make him in the inline tight end. Is he a fullback? I've heard some people say he could be used in like a Kyle use check role if you're creative enough, you play him everywhere, right? But how do you use this guy? Where do you put him on the field? Because his skill set, sometimes there's a guy who's used as a tweener in college, but it's easier. It's college football, right? In the NFL, it's clear like, all right, he can do all these different things, but this one skill set is the only one that's going to translate to the NFL. So we're going to put him here. That's not even clear with Jaheim Bell. Is he a big slot receiver? Well, he's not really fast enough. Is he a, you know, Mike Gesicki kind of tight end? Well, he's not really big enough. Is he a, a move tight end? Yeah, maybe, but is, you know, does he have the yard after catch? But like, and that's not to say he's just a bad player. Like he's definitely, there's things he's good at as well, but you, you ask five different scouts what position he plays, you might get five different answers. For a team like the Patriots, that's kind of rebuilding their offense, a new offensive coordinator and starting from scratch. A guy like that could be very enticing because, you're not going to draft Jaheim Bell to fill a role that you feel is absent. You're drafting Jaheim Bell to create a new role in your offense. And the Patriots are in a position to do that. I think he would supplement Hunter Henry very well. Uh, didn't have a great pre-draft process. Didn't test well at the combine. Didn't have the best senior bowl. So they may be able to get him middle of day three. He's a guy, yeah, I could see them targeting him for sure. He, and, you know, and watching him and also looking at some of those measurables, it's not yeah. an exact comp, but I think this is fair and certainly relatable to Patriots fans. Jonu Smith came to mind, right? Yeah. Like, 
Yeah. He, he can move around everywhere. You try him in the backfield, it's not a great fit, but he's the undersized, more athletic F move tight end. And the testing numbers were close enough. Again, I, I threw that in there in our, yeah. our mock draft or breakdown or um, some prospect bits that I had the other day. And so that's the that's name I would keep in mind. And again, also understanding that the statistical ceiling seemingly in New England might be uh, John M. Smith. And that's what you should have from a fourth or fifth round pick, which is a disappointment. Right. But again, we're, we're, we're trying to pick your brain here. Uh, before you and I take turns and draft five prospects that we're most yeah. maximum confident the Patriots will draft, and we're going to have stakes here, uh, this okay. part, you know. Uh, give yeah. us a couple more players, 30 seconds on each, that just Alex Barth absolutely loves. All right, well, I won't give away any of the guys I'm I'm uh, planning to pick in a little bit. I'll actually start with a guy, maybe not even for the Patriots, but I think yes. Patriots fans should know about. And this is the guy Bill Belichick would have picked if he was still here. Um, and that is Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Mm. Super defensive back. That's what I've been calling him. He played mostly boundary corner at Iowa, and he's going to do some of that in the NFL. But this is a guy who is an elite tier athlete. He His, his reaction is incredible. His instincts are incredible. And... The way I see him fitting in the NFL is you need a guy, you need extra help on the boundary this week. All right, Cooper DeGene, you're going to be a boundary corner this week. You need a guy to cover running back. All right, Cooper DeGene, that's what you're doing this week. You feel like you need more help at free safety. That's what he's going to do this week. Also an elite kick and punt returner. Um, Super, super, super fun player. Just like old school football player. If you you just want to have fun watching a prospect, um, that's a guy I'd, I'd definitely tune into. I'd, I'd, I'd definitely watch a little bit. For the Patriots... And he should go in like the, the mid-20s, right? We're talking like back into the first round. I've seen some people say he could be the top corner off the board. I don't see it. But hmm. if you're a defense that loves versatility, like, again, this is why I think in theory he's a great fit for the Patriots. If you ever ask any Patriots corner or safety about, you know, your cornerback room or your safety room, they will cut you off and say no. We're all defensive backs. Cooper DeGene is the embodiment of that. And that's why I think, like, if you if a team values that, let's say Bill had been hired by the Falcons, Cooper DeGene would have been the eighth overall pick. I have no well, doubt about that. And let's, um, <laughs> it's, it's another good breakdown. And I just want to stop here because I think yeah. some people listening would be like, okay, cool. You just told a bunch of squares that they're squares and they go, no, we're rectangles. Like, the fuck, who cares? You know, like, <laughs> but the, the point is, the Patriots defensive backs meet together. This was a change enacted in 2019 uh, when Mike Pellegrino was a new quarterbacks coach. Brian Belichick was their safeties coach, all very green. So they kind of put their heads together and let yeah, them develop yeah. and talk. And what the benefit of this is the way the Patriots taught, and I think still will teach their defense, is conceptually, meaning you're not just going to understand if Cooper Jadine comes in, you know, this is what outside cornerbacks do. No, you're going to know everyone's assignment kind of in the back seven. And that allows right. them not only just – extra depth by being able to rotate players, but flexibility within the scheme to make checks or calls or adjustments that disguises it snap to snap. Even if it might be cover two, like I can go from the flat to hook curl or spin back and play the deep half. And you can only do that if you all consider yourselves as they do as defensive backs and are taught that as opposed to, okay, slots meet at one o'clock, then right. outside guys at one thirty, and then safeties will come out, you know, meet at two. To borrow a phrase from Dante Scarnecchia that he used to use a lot for the offensive line that I think applies here, you want a group that sees it all through the same eyes. And that's very true on the offensive line. And I think the Patriots intentionally or unintentionally uh, applied that to their secondary. I'll go back to players the Patriots might take, though. Um, no, no, no. Well, I just I just want to know guys you like because we're going to get oh, to guys the I like. We're, we're going to have our stakes and we're going to have our players and guys that I've like teed up. And, and you know, again, I'll, I'll just spoil this now. Yeah. Whoever predicts more players at the Patriots draft between Alex and I coming up in a few minutes. Oh, is the other guy a six pack. So that's love that. those are players that we love for the Patriots. These are just guys that you love that GM Alex Barth would draft for his 33rd team expansion team that's being set up somewhere along the South Shore. Okay, so I know we talk a lot about the draft in this podcast. It's a football podcast. It's a Patriots podcast. What else are we going to do until April 25th? Well, let me tell you, soon enough, we are going to turn our attention to the Celtics and Bruins because they're getting in on the playoff action. And so can you with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where right now you can win up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks with basketball, hockey, and other sports on Prize Picks. And I'll tell you, look, I like Prize Picks for baseball too. The Red Sox just started up, they're playing the Mariners, the A's. I put a little money down and I got a lot more money back. So download the app today. 
and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. I did the same. Again, download the app today. Use code CLNS at Price Picks for a first deposit match up to $100, and you can do the same. Basketball, hockey, and baseball. We got a lot to do until the draft, and you can find it all at Price Picks. All right, I'll um along those lines then, I guess I'll go. And 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 the Patriots, you know, maybe could uh draft this guy, but um, I, I'm just a big fan of his is uh, Patrick Paul. Mm. I think it tackle from Houston. I'm a big believer and he can't teach size. And Patrick Paul is he's six, seven, 36 inch wingspan, 330 something pounds. And he moves so well for his size. This is what's weird about Patrick Paul. Again, six, seven, 333. He plays like a six foot four, 310 pound tackle. And that comes with pros and cons. He moves incredibly well for a guy his size, but there's also sometimes you watch him and you're like, why are you getting bullied? Do you know how big you are? Like, get back. So I think that's coachable. It's not a lack of aggression. He definitely is nasty, but it's a, he almost tries to like finesse when it's like, no dude, just, just, just hit the guy. Just, just extend your arms. Like it's, you remember the game you'd play little siblings, you put your head, your hand on their forehead and they swing their arms. They can't hit you. It's like, you can do that to any of these guys you're facing. And instead, he's trying to, like, get cute with, you know, hand movements and stuff. It's like, no, just go out there and get him. So I think that's coachable. And if you can coach him up, this is a guy that's going to be a matchup problem for anybody because he has that tremendous size and movement ability. Um, and th those are always some of the players I gravitate towards are, do you have the things that I can't coach? I think as an NFL team, ideally, you should believe in your coaching staff. So I'm looking at the guys that, all right, what does my coaching staff know how to do well, know how to teach well? Who are the guys that have everything but that? And for a guy like Scott Peters, who has a background in MMA, hand fighting, things like that. I was just looking with, that up. Look at you. Synergy right. here in the podcast. I was like, it's not judo. It's not jujitsu. It's just straight up MMA. I'm going to get my hands on you and break you, which Scott Peters is still built enough to do. Had his own and, gym training guys who like participated in, in international competitions. And he did this last year. They draft when he was with the Browns, they drafted Dewan Jones, who's, I mean, another level, 6'8, 370. Yeah. But they got a lot out of him last year, I think, in Cleveland. So a little different body type, a little different skill set. But these once you hit a certain threshold of size, the coaching points become different because you're simply able to play differently on the line. And this is a coaching staff that just dealt with something like that. All right, give us one more, and then we'll get to our draft. Uh, all right, well, I mean, I, I guess I got to be on brand here, and I've had zero chances to talk about this guy because Bryce Beringer had a very solid uh, rookie oh, no. season. Oh, Tory Taylor. Tory Taylor, oh. punt to win. This guy, so I, I said if Bill went to the Falcons, Cooper DeGene would have went um, would have went eighth, right? Tory Taylor would have went 40, whatever if the Falcons were picking. Um, rewrote every single NCAA season, career, like they're all gone. It's all Tory Taylor now. Uh, and he, he punted for Iowa. So it's not like he had a ton of chances to, you know, short fields, whatever. He was regularly flipping the field. Um 44 net average last year, career inside the 20 percentage. And keep in mind, most of the time he's punting from in his own end zone uh, of just under 40%. He's also a tank. He's like 6'5", 230. He can tackle. So in that new kickoff rule, I don't know if I'm too in the weeds on this. I'd love to ask Bill this. The, and Bill kind of talked about this on McAfee. They're going to want like bigger, stronger guys now on kickoff coverage because there's no more running start. And you just have to be able to shed a block immediately. Well, one guy does get a running start, and that's the kicker because he's coming down from where the ball is. And I wonder if any teams will be crazy enough to look at that and say, if we can get a kicker who can tackle, there may be an advantage there in this new kickoff rule helping with our coverage. So, you know, I had to do it. Tory Taylor, Iowa, put him on the board. I was I was upset at, at the start, but uh, but you won me over, and that's that again. That's All right, good. that's why we have you on. I well, <laughs> you won me over to be clear when you introduced the idea of punters and violence and tackling. Like this, I don't I don't care about how he's flipping the field. And I was someone who was excited for Bryce Berenger and expressed that I think on Tom Kern's podcast, and then was poo pooed and forced off the pod by Tom and Mike Jardy. I think Bill Perry's on there too. But the point is, I I think it's a good point because. The, it, Punters or kickoff specialists are going to have to, or kickers, obviously, right? practice tackling more now in a way that they never had to before. Like, I don't think there'll be full contact, obviously, in 11-on-11 11 11 fully padded practices, but 
they are now literally the last line of defense. They are the single right. high safety in every Greg Williams defense where everyone's like, I can't see him on the all 22. Oh, he's all the <laughs> way back there. And that's an important role because you need to be in there. I, I don't know. Uh, have any other thoughts? I want to talk to some more people, you know, within the league about how that rule is going to work. But I think that's a good one where maybe every kicker now looks like Adam Vinatieri post career <laughs> at the start of their career, uh, so they can make these tackles. So it's a good point by you. Okay, to Thanks. the main event. Yeah, we are having a Patriots draft pick draft. These are the players that Alex and I have teed up. We have our own small big boards. We're only going to go five rounds that we think they are most likely to draft like most confident it could be any position it could be any round it could be anything that makes us think the Patriots are in on this guy and I'm going to get free beer because I'm going to name more of those players than the other guy uh I told you those are that's it those are the rules do you have any other questions though before we get into this who's picking first great question you are because I am a gracious host and uh sometimes a dictator but we're in a good mood here today well then off the top I guess I gotta go Drake May I, just, I I have to do it. I mean, through all the, the noise of the trades and the J.J. McCarthy thing of it all, and now Michael Penix is getting this run, which I love. I'm a big Michael Penix guy, but not over Drake May. You know what Occam's razor is? Yes. Yeah. Most often, the or, or, or most of the time, the most obvious answer is the right answer. I think for where the Patriots are, you have to embrace that right now. And they spent, I don't want to say 20 years, because obviously Bill had some tremendous drafts for a long time, but... We spent the last five, six years, we as media fans, everybody kind of bemoaning that, why won't they just be normal during the draft? Why do they have to be so unorthodox, get too cute? Now people want them to trade back for a quarterback. That's happened. Trading back in the first round for a quarterback has happened five times in the last 30 years. It hasn't happened in a decade. EJ Manuel's last one. Last time it happened in the top five was 1995. The Panthers traded back from one to five to take Kerry Collins. And by the way, missed on Steve McNair. So Bill's gone, and now everybody wants them to do the unorthodox thing? No. Drake May, third, stick it and pick it. He was atop my board. You make a great point. I was uh, writing a column off of Elliot Wolf's comments yesterday yeah. and, and just kind of thinking about, you know, Drake May, where this is probably going, right? We're going to, it's going to be a full circle. Everyone starts right. going, the Patriots are going to take Caleb Williams or Drake May. We're all watching the draft. Uh, pick probabilities. Are they going to pick second? Or is it third? Are they going to fall out of the top five? And did this for like the last six weeks of the season. They end up at third. Turns out this is not a two-quarterback class. It's a three-quarterback class. They'll have one available that they believe is worthy of the third overall pick. And we know this because Elliot said that yesterday, Right. which also reminds me, I forgot to ask you, just your initial impression really quickly of, of what he said or didn't say yesterday we met for his pre-death press conference. I think my like my big picture was just that they're keeping all options on the table, which they has been, I think, a big overarching me- message throughout the offseason. Two uh, just smaller things that stood out to me. Chooks a core for pencil ribbons, the left tackle. I don't love that. Um, gives me shades of Marshall Newhouse, the guy that's only played right tackle in the NFL. That's a harder move than people think. It's it, Flipping sides is tougher than moving like right tackle to right guard. And then um, along the same lines on the offensive line, he when he's talking about, he was asked, do you have a team to support uh, a rookie quarterback? And he said, yeah, we have you know NFL players. He lists off the offensive line. And he says, Mike Onwenu, he says Okorafor, he says David Andrews, and he, he says three rookies, but he means Jake Andrews, Antonio Mafi, City So. He did not say Cole Strange. I thought that was very interesting. This is no longer the regime that drafted Cole Strange. He, he's dealt with a ton of injuries. There's some good tape, but not enough to necessarily support him unilaterally remaining the left guard. I wonder if that's a job that's open for competition when camp starts. It's another great note by you, and I will say that that was largely my takeaway too because I think what yeah. people don't understand and, – and look, the press conferences uh, are to bring the media in. It's to speak to the fans. But Elliot knows that his target audience is a two-fold group. The right. 31 other front offices who are studying the tape of that press conference in the same way that Bill used to study press conferences of other coaches looking, mining, hunting for tells about what's going to happen on Sunday or their plans or injury reports – and what his draft intentions are. By keeping all of his options open, he looked at those 31 other teams and says, I'm not telling you bleep. And he did it with a smile on his face. The other group that he's talking to, though, are the people inside his own building. Because everyone knows he's this de facto GM. His contract's up in in May, but it seems like he's going to, you know, stick around. And they know he's a sharp guy, he's a smart guy, a little bit quiet. But they don't know how he's going to handle himself and represent the rest of the organization. So when he says things like, 
we have NFL receivers. I do think our receiving group and our offensive line is being underrated. That, to me, was not speaking to us and an indication that this guy is so out of touch. It's to say he was standing by his players and wanted to risk the embarrassment, the backlash, the negative right. stuff that's always going to come from the media because he said it's more important for me to stand by those guys and say, I have your back because they've only heard him now speak twice. And the first time was at the combine. This time was in their own building with them around the corner, lifting, meeting, running. And then he's going talking about the team and says, I feel good about us. That contributes to the vibe. That That's something just to keep in mind. Uh, but you and I are largely aligned there. Okay. Back to the draft. So I will say this draft has a sneaky amount of strategy to it. Not because this is something I invented this morning when I was thinking, what should we talk about? Even though I knew we were yeah. going to do prospects that Patriots should take. But you took Drake May. Yeah. If Drake May is gone at number two, obviously they've got a decision there at quarterback. So I could either go quarterback now or wait a little bit later. But also, I'm not as sold that they will just pull the trigger on Jaden Daniels, the consensus two or three quarterback in this draft, where McCarthy's okay. closer to four, at least in the media side. So I'm going to wait. And instead, I'm going to take an offensive tackle who should be there in their second round pick. Fits from an athletic profile standpoint when you look at what the Packers have drafted over the years. He fits from a versatility standpoint, playing both offensive tackle spots. And oh, by the way, he's got a little bit of a mean streak to him. So when Scott Peters, kid you not, is grabbing these dudes in the pre-draft meetings at the combine <laughs> just to get his hands on them and is shaking them, something I was told, um, this guy is going to meet the moment and stick his chest out. And that is Kingsley Suamata'ia. And he's 21. He had a top 30 visit here in New England. He's been rumored to maybe go in the back end of the first round because there's a drop-off right in talent from the offensive tackles, unlike right. the receivers. Like the receivers just go for days. You can go one at the end of the second round and feel great about him. He, he's my top pick here. Again, from an agility standpoint, um, you know, the versatility, the youth, he's he's strong enough. He's raw, don't get me wrong, but this is a team, a front office that knows they have time. Yeah, and that's a good pick, and that's a guy that I think you talk about, or they've talked about, you know, getting, building the culture and getting the kind of people they want to work with. And he's somebody that had a role like that at the BYU program and, I think in a left tackle, it's kind of like a quarterback. You want a guy that everybody's going to get behind, literally and figuratively. And it doesn't have to be a left tackle. I guess you want that on the offensive line. It's been David Andrews. David Andrews, I mean, he's been a team captain, but he's also been kind of the de facto captain of that offensive line for a long time. Yes. And Kingsley Sumatia, from what I read and, and hear, is like another guy that maybe, you know, who's going to be that next guy that steps up? Is it Mike Gonwenu? Maybe. But having another guy like this is our offensive lineman. This is the guy that represents this position group. You're looking for that if you're taking him in the first round. You're not just looking for a starting caliber left tackle. You are. But you're looking for a guy that's going to anchor your offensive line. And I think Sue Mattia uh, could fit that mold. So I don't know if you want to move on to my next pick because it's actually funny you, you um, the way you set well, that just- up. I'll just add really quickly because he is a team captain, like you're saying. And the, yeah. the, left, the left tackle part is yeah. is an underrated. I mean, as far I, – I glossed over it in my discussion of him. Right. Like, the versatility is important. The, the, the intangibles are good. The physical prototype is exceptionally important. There are only a handful of tackles, including your guy Patrick Paul, who fit with yeah. the Packers historically have targeted. But him playing left tackle last year in a very right tackle heavy class – is important. So I see this as the the intersection of opportunity with the ability to take him in need. And it just makes too much sense. If they don't even trade back into, let's say number 30 with the Ravens and jump up to get him and get a fifth year option for obviously a premium position, uh, because I think he could be that good. So yeah, go on. Well, no, it's funny you say that. Cause in, in my last mock draft, I had the Patriots moving up to 30 to take, and you talked about, you know, which who's going to fall from tackle to 34. If it's not Kingsley, it's going to be Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma. All right. Who I they've they've met with they hosted for a visit. Um, so the the thing about Guy and he's another one of these big, long, athletic tackles. Not super experienced, fifteen career starts, so it's not quite a Marius Mims, but it's not exactly a veteran either. Uh, right tackle at Oklahoma, but right tackle in a lefty quarterback offense. Dylan Gabriel, uh, who's not coming out this year, he'll be. Or I think he transferred. He's somewhere. Every quarterback transferred. Uh, Dylan Gabriel's a lefty. So as much as I just said with like Chooks of Korofor, I don't love the idea of moving a right tackle to left tackle hasn't played it because it's like learning to write with your other hand. There is an element of, so at the same time, like if the Patriots drafted Michael Penix, right? I'm moving Michael Nwenu back into right guard because 
there are certain things that come with being a blind side tackle on either side that are unique that I think might tailor better to somebody else's game. Guyton's done the blind side thing. And I think the athleticism helps a guy move from one side to the other. Like you said, they maybe don't need a guy initially. The way I've talked about Tyler Guyton, I don't think he's a day one starter, but I think he's a year one starter. I think you can start Chooks at core for whoever over there at left tackle and you see how it goes. But by the time he gets like Halloween, a guy like Tyler Guyton is probably going to be ready. He's going to have seen some more, you know, live NFL reps. And he has that significant upside given his athleticism, given his size, given his experience as a blindside protector, I think to be a franchise kind of left tackle. So do they trade up for him? Is he there at 34? Cause Kingsley goes earlier. These two guys are going to kind of, one's going to be the last tackle in the first round. One's going to be the first tackle in the second round. We just don't know which is which yet. Um, but they they both make a ton of sense for the Patriots. They really do. And it's funny when you said he's done the blind side thing. I'm like, was he star, you know, portrayed in a movie that later had tons of regrets and ended with lawsuits? And <laughs> terrible things for Michael Orr. Like, God, I hope not. It's been uh, no, he's blind side uh, blocker peak, thing. Yeah, peaked in, in theaters. Uh, shout out to Michael Orr. But no, I like it. He's another guy. Again, you look at uh, short shuttle three cone, you know, things that they value in terms of uh, length and positional versatility. Tyler Guyton's right there with a lot of the other tackles that the yeah. that the Patriots um, now will like following a Packer model. Okay, so Drake May's gone. Tyler Guyton's gone. Kingsley's gone. I'm yeah. going to add another offensive tackle. Okay. And I like watching this guy. He would have fit in my draft crushes. He fits, again, the athletic mold, which I'm going to stop talking about. Um, he He's more versatile than any of guys we've talked about. It's Brandon Coleman at a TCU. And some see him because he's only 6'4". Uh, I think he's around 320 is maybe he'll move inside and he played guard and left tackle at TCU because they needed him to move. And he he's a projected, right. you know, late second, probably third round pick right here. But again, for what the Patriots want, his experience, his toughness, again, speaking of the Scott Peters, part of this is now their lead yeah. offensive line coach. I just think the fit makes so much sense. He would probably be in 68, but I'm also leaving myself some options here where, okay, Guyton goes, you know, 24 to Dallas. And then Kingsley goes to, you know, the Packers at 25 or, or the Chiefs or something or whatever. They're off the board. And the Patriots go, okay, we need to take a receiver now. And then we'll wait till the third or we'll trade up into the back end of the second. I think Coleman just fits. Again, a left tackle, versatile, tough, athletic enough. Felgram has big board pick too. So uh, oh, we good. got that going for it. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly wonder if they could get him a little later. I don't know about 102, but wow. do you trade back up into – He's a tough one to project because he's one of these guys that teams that have him as a guard probably have him rated a little higher, but by nature of being a guard, like how high are you going to take him versus teams that have him rated a little lower as a tackle, but tackles naturally grade higher. Uh, I think worst case scenario with him, you end up with a solid four positional backup, which isn't nothing. There's tremendous yeah. value in that. The Patriots spent three years desperately trying to replace Adrian Waddle. I don't know that anybody noticed, but that happened. I think there's value in that. The toughness, the team captain thing. I could totally see him on the Patriots. Absolutely. All right. So what is your, so we're halfway through here. Once you make this pick, yeah. who's your next pick? All right. I got to get this one. Cause I, I, people are probably waiting for me to say this. Bub means wide receiver Pittsburgh. I have been big on Bub means uh, since like January, even though PFF didn't put him in the simulator till last week. Uh, wow. or I think this week. Yeah, I know. Every year there's one player that they just did that, under my did that hurt? And out. It were did. You, it does. Waking up every morning, like I still play Immaculate Grid and Wordle with my wife, and you were just checking PFF. Just to well, make I sure do. Was in there. I do the the live Mac dra mock drafts on the Patriots Beat podcast, and we're sitting there at like 193, and everybody in the chat is like, "Bub means, Bub means." I'm like, "Yeah, it'd be great." Too bad. Um, <laughs> so. Why I like, let me start with this. Why I like Bub Means for the Patriots. Tyquan Underwood was his coach at Pitt, was his positional coach. And from my understanding, like, there's a good relationship there, right? They like they, they like working together. They both felt they, they worked well with each other. So sometimes this comes down to, especially later on day three, is there one guy in the room who's going to, you know, put his fist on the table for a prospect and really be like, this is the guy we got to grab here. And I feel like Bub Means should have a guy like that in the room with the Patriots when it comes to Tyquan Underwood. Why do I like him as a player? Good size. So 6'1", 215 at the combine, or like 212 at the combine. Then he was 225 at his pro day. I have no idea what happened there. 
I haven't heard an answer on it. 10 pounds in like three weeks seems like a bit much. I wonder if it was a clerical error. But what are those sandwiches in Pittsburgh. Um, oh, well, Permantis is the Permanti, yeah. The he's place just like that, posted up at Permantis every every day. I wouldn't blame him. I Permantis is is good, but I mean, some more. I don't know that he can play in the NFL 225. Could he play at 220? Maybe because he's a big deep threat receiver. So he's great at the catch point. Corners are going to have trouble, you know, keeping their hands on him at the line of scrimmage. Last year, he showed great growth after the catch. The tough thing about Means, and part of the reason I think he's projected low as low as he is, that pit offense last year was atrocious. It got so here's how bad it was. Their starting quarterback week one by like November was their third string tight end. That's I I mean, yeah. you can you can put them in the so you follow Penn State, so you probably keep an eye on Pitt, like you know. You well, they, put, they just had, you know, uh, like the Brian Flores Dolphins cycled through offensive coordinators like yeah. you might have girlfriends your freshman year of college. And Pitt has been doing the same thing because no one really wants to sit and work for Pat Narduzzi. And so that limits right. the pool and then creates kind of a top-down dysfunction where, again, you have the starting quarterback going to play tight end, uh, not first string, not second string, but third string. And they play a very physical style and it keeps them afloat always five to seven. You know, they broke right. three uh, through like a 10 and two season a couple years ago. But yeah, it's, it's not a place where you can thrive. And Tyquan Underwood, you would think, is able to separate. This stuff was his fault, and he's definitely a height, weight, speed guy. You're not banking on the productivity. But this stuff was not, and this stuff we can work with. So that's what I think the value is. And in a draft where so many receivers have such outstanding production, Means was a cornerback at Tennessee, didn't play for two years, transferred to Louisiana Tech, was a rotational receiver there, gets to pit, suddenly has a chance to shine on the Power 5 stage, and is in basically East Coast Iowa's offense, and kind of makes him a little bit of a hidden gem. So I'm not sitting here saying Bub Means is going to solve all the Patriots wide receiver problems. I don't think he is. But as the second guy, if they double dip at the position, love that. Love that. You're taking a shot on a guy who has flashed more than he's been consistent, but you have a better idea of what was behind the flashes. So maybe you feel a little more comfortable taking that shot. All right. My third round pick is going to be another receiver, Javon Baker. Uh, okay. he, he is another favorite in a lot of Patriots mock drafts, mid round discussion, probably third round pick 68 might be a little early for some, but again, I leave myself uh, some room in case they trade back from 68 or up from one Oh two to go get him. ex Alabama transfer, um, I think it was second in the FBS in terms of yards per reception, like a big play waiting to happen and not strictly in a speed sense. He's not an otherworldly athlete, but the body control and the rare combination of a guy who can be a deep threat and is good after the catch is really appealing here. So I think they look there and it's a different offense, right? We've got smells on down at UCF, but say that's a guy we want to gamble on. I know Elliot has, has prized, um, you know, body control. Obviously hands are, are going to be a big part of this yeah. he has some here and there who doesn't. I just think with the top 30 visit done, the fit, he can play at X where they really need some of those guys. He's he's someone that just kind of makes too much sense if he's on the board not to take. If we're doing the Occam's Razor draft right. big board to, to take in at 68 or maybe move up from 102. Yeah, it, it's interesting because he's too early to take as a second wide receiver, but is the true ceiling there? They do need an X. And I like the idea if you draft Javon Baker of – He's going to be our ex. And next year, we're going to go try to find like that electric Z, like that Jalen Waddle kind of player. And that's the two year plan. In that kind of system, I think he's great. I think he's fantastic. Elliot Wolf talked about yesterday, you know, when asked about the wide receiver room, the X position, do we have that guy that can consistently win on the backside three by one? That's maybe a little high for Baker, but that doesn't mean there aren't things he brings of value. And getting a player like him in the building, if you're looking at it like a two or three year window, they are going to need a guy that brings what he brings at some point. If you have a chance to get him, great. Do it. Yeah. Okay. So just to recap, and then we'll go through these yeah. last two picks pretty quickly. Okay. You took Drake May, then went Tyler yeah. Guyton, then Bub Means. Again, most likely Patriots draft picks. Uh, yeah. I led off with uh, Kingsley Suamataia and then went with, uh, as we just covered now, Javon Baker and Brandon Coleman. So two offensive tackles, because we know they're going to attack those positions. Yeah. A wide receiver, you have a quarterback, an offensive tackle, and a wide receiver. Where are you going next? Uh, I feel like I should mix in some de defense here. So I'm going to go with, so I was Don't tempted to go with the TCU guy, Josh. Sorry, what was that? No, no, I have a defensive guy that's oh. on my board coming up. So I'm just okay. saying, don't do it. <laughs> don't say so it. I was, I was tempted to go with Josh Newton from TCU. If Belichick was here, I'd go with him. But mm -hmm. 
keeping the new front office in mind, Cam Kitchens, safety from Miami. Is that okay. who it was? Say again? Did I steal your pick? Did I steal your pick? No, you did not. No, but All I right. like the pick. And, and so, you know, I think you're going to explain why. Yeah, so Kitchens, watching him at Miami, the instincts are off the charts. Like, you watch him, and it's like, he knew the play. How did he not know the play? The way he just fires on the ball, attacks downhill. Now, the testing of the combine didn't reflect that. He had a brutal combine, to put it lightly. You know who else had a brutal combine? Puka Nakua. And that's why he fell, right? And, and um, but the, the like, behind-the-scenes data was there. Uh, uh, Kitchens was at Miami with Alonzo Heisman. Yeah. Who, you know, he's obviously close with a lot of those guys. So the Patriots have a closer idea. And I just... I don't let the combine totally dictate how I view players. It's definitely relevant, but Cam Kitchens ran like a four, six, five. I think I don't see a four, six, five. I, I don't think he's a four, three kind of guy. I don't think he has that speed, but you give me a four five guy with the instincts to kind of close that gap a little bit. Cause he's breaking on the ball so much quicker. He's never going to be Devin McCourty, but I think the Patriots having a free safety option, even if it's not their main go-to, but having that in their bag, so 40, 50% usage rate, something like that, they can play Kyle Duggar and they can play Jabril Peppers in the slot where they're at their best and have somebody else take care of the back end. Kitchens could be that guy. He was supposed to be a you know fringe first round pick before the combine. Now some people think he's not going to go till day three. If they go to Alonzo Highsmith and say, should we worry about the combine? And he says, no, they're going to see that as a tremendous, tremendous value pick at a position of need. And maybe Highsmith doesn't sign off on it, and I just wasted two minutes. But well, it's a on the chance round. he does, right? On the chance he does, could be a tremendous value pick at a position in need. I like the idea. So the instincts, as far as the safety goes, it's yeah. a, is a spot on point because teams value that. And I even heard Mark Dominic, Xbox GM, on a call now because he works for CS Sirius XM, making that point of I'll take the four or five guy with instincts versus the 4-4 four, four track athlete who's looking one way and has to race back the other because he misdiagnosed the play. To me, though, 4-6-5 is pretty damning as a safety. And when I look at the fit, I don't trust him to play single high. And if I did, I would prefer Peppers or Duggar in that role. I think he's a good football yeah. player. And at this point, you're adding guys who are just kind of useful, even if you don't have an exact role carved out. And the Highsmith stamp, if he, if he gives it, is going to go a long, long, long way. Like he's known Elliot since 1997. He's had tons of experience, obviously there day to day to day with the program. I just think if they're looking for a free safety, um, his name escapes me now, but you can fill this in. It's something like Dardarian from Texas Tech. Kid who actually uh, runs did, a uh, did, did Adrian Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech. Yeah. yeah, he'd be a good, he's going to go a little bit earlier. Uh, he's yeah. they're probably going to trade like back end of the third round, but yeah, he could be him and Kalen Bullock are the two top guys in that range. Right. And I think it's uh, Mark Perry out of TCU. Um, the, uh, yeah, they, they just met recently. with him, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just did. So, you know, I, I I lean a little bit more towards the raw speed for safeties, but it's the instincts point is a good one because Devin yeah. McCourty was not just a 4-4 guy. He had exceptional eye discipline instincts. Everything that we watched with Devin McCourty, I don't need to explain. Right. That. Um, but I do see that as kind of like a late round flyer guy like you're talking about. Tyquan Underwood stands on the table, says, take my guy. Alonzo Heithmas right. stands on the table. He doesn't need to finish the sentence. It's, I think it's just it's just going to happen. I went defense as I would well. say, sorry, real quick. I'd say along those yeah. lines too, this won't count as my pick, but Miami has another safety, James Williams, a little later in the draft. He's more of a true box safety, but that could be, those are the two guys I look at with Highsmith that like would be the guys he'd probably stand on the table for. Speaking of more like rough offenses, like all those horrible, horrible losses last year for UM, uh, oh, Georgia man. Tech. like they're, they're just there's just a dearth of offensive players there because of just how like dysfunctional it was. Uh, right. Yeah, it's just a just a difficult situation. I'm going down to Mississippi State and I'm grabbing yep. a corner who did not have an interception, which under the previous regime, that's bad. That's that's really not good. They, <laughs> Patriots always prioritize ball skills in a way that like you need um, man to man skill sets and be able to make a play in the ball. And I don't think you can entirely coach that. But when I look at his profile as being 6'2", when I look at the speed is running in the 4'4", and he's only 188, so he's a little thinner. He's not Emmanuel Forbes, who was 20 pounds lighter than that and went in the first round. Forbes also had insane ball production. But there's a two-year starter, uh, Camry, uh, DeCamry and Richardson, who originally took a top 30 visit. I think the Patriots are not going to mess around with sub six-foot corners in this draft. He's expected to go fourth or fifth round. I think between the athleticism, 
and the competition. I, I said 4-4. He actually ran 4-3-4 uh, along with a good vertical jump. Like That's a guy to me that fits the need at the time that they're finally going to address it. Yeah, so it's funny. Elliot Wolf said yesterday, he was asked about, you know, athletics, are you drafting football players? Or are you drafting athletes? And he said, football skill is paramount. But later on day three, you know, we will take some height, you know, what do you say? Height, length, speed chances, right? Or height, length, athleticism, whatever it was. This is that guy. This is a guy that it just, you know, brings the size, brings the speed you want. Okay, can you teach him to play corner? Patriots have a pretty good history with those guys. And Mike Pellegrino has a pretty good history with those guys. So there's there's a couple guys later on day three, I think, fit that mold. Uh, Beanie Bishop from West Virginia. Um, there's another guy from Old Miss, uh, DeAndrick Prince, I think his name is. But uh, Richardson stands out, just two-year starter in the SEC. Even though the production's not there, the experience is. And experience at the cornerback position is important because the more you see, the more you can process, the better you'll react. So, yeah, I could definitely see that, especially even honestly, if they double dip at corner, because he's going to have value on special teams as well. Yeah, and they and the SEC level of competition. So plus, you know, I, I'll admit right. it, the, the top 30 visit put this over the top for me. The ball okay. skills again, if we're studying this from a Bill Belichick draft guide or history standpoint, off the board. Like you just <laughs> that guy's not getting taken. And uh there are some other corners that I like man to man, which I'll just bring them now, like Kyrie Jackson at Oregon. Um, yeah, transferred. Obviously, there's some off field concerns there getting suspended at Alabama. But again, the man to man types a little bit bigger. You know, Jackson six three. Um, but I, I just, you know, for a new regime, new culture, I think they're going to stay away from the guys with quote unquote character concerns, which is a broad term that lumps right. in guys who, you know, uh, missed a couple classes or overslept or whatever versus like had a DUI, didn't care. So there, there's there's a lot of room there, but Jackson, you know, there, there are some quote unquote off field concerns. So right. that's it. All right, your last pick. Um, I'm going to go. We're going to go back to the Washington Huskies. Devin Colt. Nice. I think tight end is a position where they probably wait. I know some people have talked about Cade Stover, even Jatavian Sanders. I think they're going to wait and I actually go back to that Elliot Wolf quote where later in the draft you're looking more just for athletes to teach how to play football. Um, I was tempted to go tip Raymond because they do need a blocking tight end, but mm, that's a favorite want... of Pat's Twitter, the Illinois kid. And I, oh, the yeah. first time I looked them up and was like, are these half season stats? Like, well, I know Illinois wasn't great, but like, what are we looking at here? Yeah. You're looking at um, late career Dwayne Allen. That's, that's the idea you're, because they, they refused to throw poor Dwayne Allen the ball for two years, but he was out there blocking his ass off. But I'm going to go with uh, Devin Culp. Really good athlete at the tight end position. They have time to develop a guy. Hunter Henry signed for three years. They have Austin Hooper yeah. under contract this year. I do think they're going to take a Husky. I I don't know how much Adele Bill's given them, but Steve obviously still has connections in the building. And uh, Steve didn't coach Devin Culp, but he's out there for the pro day. He's talking to the coaches. Um, Devin Culp, Washington, put him on the board. All right. My last pick, I'm, I'm split. I either have a third offensive tackle who's had a 30 visit and it's going to okay. be a sixth or seventh round dart throw uh, that they bank on as a developmental guy played left tackle or the pick I'm actually going to make, which is Jaden Daniels. And this is to okay. head against Drake may. Yeah. Not smart. Drake may going number two and then Jaden Daniels falling to them at number three. And I know there are high level decision makers in the organization who like Jaden Daniels has been reported on. Uh, we've done yeah. it at the Herald, but you know, when we talked to Elliot Wolf yesterday too, he seemed to indicate like, this group of, you know, it's him, it's Matt Groh, it's Gerard Mayo, then it's a coordinator. And, like, you've got other experienced people, Alonzo Highsmith, in there. Like, there's enough support for both quarterbacks. And so I think right now, again, if May goes two to Washington, we are all going to have a mini meltdown in the media. Uh, but we will very quickly come around because Jane Daniels is widely regarded as uh, at least supposedly in the league is just as good, and I think the Patriots are a part of that. And uh, in case that does happen, he is my fifth pick. So to review – uh, King, offensive tackle at a BYU for me. This is my team. Then your draft, and we got a quick yeah. mailbag, and we'll get out of here. Uh, so I'm out to Ia at a BYU left tackle prospects. Uh, another left tackle, TCU's Brandon Coleman, mid round pick. I think his name is a great fit. Javon Baker, UCF receiver, could play X. You're playing a little bit of a ceiling. X Alabama transfer took a top thirty visit. To Cameron Richardson, also top thirty visit. Mississippi State corner, six foot two, uh, one eighty eight, ran a four three four. Like traits pick middle day. Feel like you can coach him up. And then Jaden Daniels, who needs no further introduction. All right. Alex Barth's draft classes looks like what? Uh, we got Drake May, 
needs no introduction. Tyler <laughs> Guyton kind of, it's funny. A lot of these guys, it's going to be, it feels like it could be one or the other, right? So yeah. they wait a tackle for 34. Uh, Suma, what is it? Suma Yada? Yes. I've been saying well, Suma Tia. Not, not exactly. Okay. Cause you were leaking confidence there at the second, but Suma Mataia. Suma Mataia. Okay. Do they stay at 34 for Suma Mataia or do they go up to 30 and get Tyler Guyton who I have? Do they take, a guy like Javon Baker at 68, or do they wait a little bit and take a guy like Bub Means, who I have later on? Um, I have Cam Kitchens. I don't think he really crosses much with Richardson. And then I took Devin Culp, the tight end from Washington last. Although, hang on. You said you had another tackle. You want to bring back that guessing, guessing game real quick? Because I'm curious who it is. Um, No, because he's a small school guy. It's not uh, our friend from British Columbia. Oh, but... it's, um, it's, um, ah, Georgia State. Ah, uh, ugh. I like this guy too. He's great at the senior bowl. It's huge. Absolutely massive. Oh, I'm blanking on the name. I know exactly who it is. I just can't remember his name. Travis Foster. Glover. No, no, Travis Glover. That's yeah. who it is. Yeah. yeah. Six foot seven, played left tackle, uh, developmental. They saw him at the Hula Bowl. They saw him uh, for a private workout uh, at his pro day. And then recently had him in for a top 30. So that is, that is a lot of flirting, not to, uh, you know, finally take you out oh, for maybe cool. a couple of years and sign you to a, to a late round contract. I'll tell you what sold me on Travis Glover. There was one at the senior bowl and they're doing one-on-ones and I mean, he's getting nasty with it. And one guy kind of started coming after him after the whistle and he just stands there arms by his side and goes, try it. And the other <laughs> guy turned around and like, I know that you evaluate the football player too, but especially if I'm taking a shot on a late later tackle, like, yeah, sign me up for that. That that's what I want on my football team. Yeah. That also goes for draft me. Try right, it. Yeah. You know, see, see how it feels. See how I look in the uniform. Try it. Uh, right. Speaking of the guessing game, though, because I was going to sneak one on you late. This is a fourth fourth player. It's another All big right. school. But I think there's a little bit more size overlap. So you might you might have to make a 50-50 okay. pick. This player is five foot nine, 182. I said five, five foot nine and a half. Okay. 182, University of Michigan. Five foot. Oh, it's Blake Corn. Oh, no, wait. Five nine and a half, one eighty two. Michigan, University of Michigan. No, Blake Corm's bigger than that. It's Roman Wilson. So your final answer. I messed with you earlier when you immediately nailed I know. Chris Braswell. So don't <laughs> hang on. Well, I'm trying to oh overthink it, but don't over overthink it as a, as a professional over overthinker. Well, now I've got a third guy in mind. You know what? But th this is leading into the mailbag. A lot of Patriots fans have questions about this guy. So I'm going to take my shot on this. Mike Sainer still. Damn it. Four for four. Well done, sir. That is excellent job by you. I, I was thinking you would have to pick between Roman Wilson. Uh, Sainer still is a nickel corner. Super tough. Love to see him here. But they have enough guys who, as I described in my That's, last episode, yeah. fit in kind of a Russian doll level of corners <laughs> in New England because they're just one smaller after another. But you were four for four. You can play the Belichick Thank you. family guessing game with any of your friends. And you have full permission uh, to do that. So uh, on the mailbag, just three questions. We're starting on yeah. a downer. Uh, you know, right. people, people are upset. But we'll we'll end on a high note. That's the goal here. Chris is asking, quote, even if someone could get Kraft to spend, why would anyone want to come here with all this oh. dysfunction? It doesn't seem like a destination anymore. I should add, this is this is necessary context. I asked for mailbag questions Wednesday, immediately after that ESPN story dropped that I, you know, ah. absolutely dissected with Andy Hart. So I think Chris is a little upset by that. Uh, but here's the thing. Players don't really care what the boss says about the guy who used to be here uh, in a way that we all do much more in the media and the fan side locally. And nationally, I will also say the draw for that story was where Bill might be next. New York, Dallas, Philly. The, the, the craft sniping, I think they buried the lead, but... I would just take a breath and say, I don't think it's going to affect their free agency or draft picks. Yeah. I, I would also say teams have been signing with the Raiders for years. Teams have been <laughs> signing with the Jaguars for years. Teams, player, not teams, players, players to this day still sign with the New York Jets. Couldn't tell you why. Well, I can because they offer them the most money. That's it. They, they don't care. If you give them the, if you put the biggest dollar amount in front of them, nine times out of 10 guys are going to sign. Are there guys that may take, a little less for certain reasons, one uh, one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. But money talks. Right? The 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 quote in Jerry Maguire isn't "show me the function," it's <laughs> "show me the money." So yeah. I I wouldn't to the question's point. Like if the Patriots were to spend, if the Patriots would put the offers on the table, I that's going to get it done significantly more often than not. 
And second, I would not even secondarily to that. I, yeah. I would say tertiary, right? Because the money is a level a tier unto itself. Why players yeah. sign? Why anyone wants to come to an organization? But well underneath that are things like, and this sounds, um, I don't want to say trite, but like very basic vibes. Like how is Gerard Mayo yeah. coming off in the media? Does Drake May have a highlight that goes viral? If they do draft Drake May or Jane Daniels and he's electric, they suddenly become a hub. He's a magnet, as Gerard Mayo said, for players to come in here. So it's about coach and quarterback and how fun does it look? And it sounds silly to put so much pressure on a press conference, but those are the clips that all these guys are looking through in their Instagram reels or any kind of posts on there, things on Twitter, things that go viral for good reasons, not stuff like this, which again, I don't think they care about the politics of the upper levels. Right. But Mayo's the next player. He's young. He's, he's charismatic. If you get a quarterback in here, that changes things. Now, obviously winning, this isn't going to happen this year. But, like, you think about where the Texans were last year. Why would anyone want to go to the Texans? You talk about dysfunction. Jack yeah. Easterby. Jack Easterby. One-year one year coaches fired back-to-back. -back. Uh, Casario and the Patriot way. Who would want to go down there? It's a big market. You know, all those different things. C.J. Stroud has turned that around to where Stephon Diggs is totally okay getting traded from one of the best teams in the AFC because Texans joined that with him with a good young quarterback who you could watch make crazy plays every Sunday. So, they have a lot of work to do, but just give it a little bit of time. It won't be that quick of a and turnaround, but that those are the factors that, that could sway guys to, to come back. On top of that, too, I think the Patriots will have a thing, and, and we've heard about this a little bit, and they're going to need to pick up some winning momentum. I think there's something to be said for guys who want to come and be part of the group that brings the Patriots back, right? If they get to the doorstep, and they got to win on their own a little bit first, but like A.J. Brown changed his Twitter picture to Tom Brady yesterday, and we all went nuts. <laughs> Like there's still that little well, some it's, of us it's, stayed level headed, but yes. <laughs> all right. There's it's dormant right now. I'm not saying anybody's coming here right now because oh Tom Brady and the Patriots, but like if they can, and this is to your point, like if they hit on Drake May and he starts winning games, I do think the Patriots to some extent become the Patriots again because you're gonna have Tom Brady sitting up there on the owners in the owner's box. You're gonna have guys like Teddy Bruski, like Ty Law around the building, things like that, because former player bringing guys back. You sort of see it right now at the Celtics, right? I do think it's it's not it doesn't exist right now. I'm not sitting here saying guys are signing right now for this, but if you can get it to a certain point, I think the, it grows exponentially because there will be that, there will always be that little bit of a Patriots something there. But you have to win a little bit to make it matter a lot. Yeah. All right, Carlos is asking. Carlos, uh, who's been on our male fan segment and was at our yeah. event last night of Vitamin C, flew across the country and oh, wow. came in, donated, um, had a great time. He is now asking, what round seems like the most logical trade back spot for the Patriots? So where does it make the most sense for them to trade back? The first, second, third, or fourth round? I, I love the idea of trading down from 34. And I actually went earlier this week. I went back and looked through each of the Patriots assigned draft slots and what trades have been made at or around that slot in each of the last six years. It's 87 trades, and you can find them all on 985thesportsup.com. The thing about the 34th pick is teams are going to get done at the end of the first round. They're going to get back in the conference room, right? Kind of reset their board, regather themselves. Oh, what? This guy fell. This guy's still available. We got to go up and get him. And you can get tremendous value. For that, and, and especially this year, where I think there are more than 32 players with first round talent in this draft, not always the case, certainly wasn't the case last year. Um, well, you know, guys who aren't first round talents will, will, will push some other guys down too, but I think they can get real tremendous value from that pick. And I look at a team like the Packers that has two second round picks, I look at a team like, um, I believe it's there's some, yeah, well, I'm, I think it's the Cardinals have like four day two picks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? That may want to go up and get a guy they're targeting. You can add a top 100, add two, maybe three picks overall. I love the idea of trading down from 34. I like 34 as well. And it's interesting too, because we, we in that space from, you know, let's call it 1130 Thursday night to yeah. 7 PM Friday. So much is made of whoever has 33 can just auction off the pick. And you're right. There are a lot right. of teams going, there are first round players still available. And then usually the team with the 33rd pick just makes the pick anyway. Like Joey Porter Jr. goes to the Steelers. The year before, it was the same deal. But where you get a ton of activity is starting around 34 and 35 and 36. Because the right. team at 33 has the most leverage. They have the most reason to ask for a bag. Something uh, irrational, unreasonable. Maybe a future first, okay? 
And so that's why that deal doesn't get done. But when you get to 35 or 36 or maybe 34, where again, I agree with you, trade down. Yeah. That's where stuff happens. And you know this if you're the Patriots because you've experienced the inverse. They've moved up to get Christian Barmore. They moved up to get Tyquan exactly. Thornton. They've done a lot of those deals recently. Different decision makers, front office, philosophy has changed. But I think they understand they need more picks. They also need a quarterback. You're going to get a quarterback or three. You can. You should. And then it's a matter of how do we stockpile from here? 34 is the way to go, especially considering, you know, guys that we didn't even bring up that I really like. Ricky Pearsall out of Florida yeah. would be a great pick if you can get in the low 40s at receiver. And then you're just hunting for an offensive tackle. And maybe some of the, the assets you picked up in this move back could then allow yeah. you to go from 68 and push back up for a Patrick Paul. You know, Kingsley's probably not going to fall that far. Uh, Brandon Coleman, other tackles. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed in that range is very interesting. A lot of those picks, a team traded up. So, like, the team from 34 trades into the first round, and then the team that got 34 trades back again. So, yeah, there's just – everybody wants to move around in that range. Yeah, so that's that's where it makes the most sense to me. All right, last one from uh, – this is a first-time uh, – I don't know. Question. A question okay. person who has written a question in for the first time. That was well done by yeah. me. You would agree? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Nailed it. Kay, Kay the God. Would you be opposed to the Patriots trading up for Brian Thomas just to make sure that the Bills don't draft him? Uh I I think I don't think the Bills have a shot at Brian Thomas unless they trade up. Because there's the top three, Adunze, neighbors, Harrison, and whatever, or this is the order I thought of them. Um and then it kind of drops off a little bit. And there are some teams that maybe don't need a receiver, but somebody's going to get aggressive. And I think Brian Thomas is going to be a top 20 pick. I don't think he's going to be a top 10 pick. I think he's going to be a top 20 pick. When you talk about trading up too, the Bills, just, you want to talk about dysfunction. The Bills just completely spring clean to their entire roster. It's Josh Allen standing in the middle of the room like Will Smith in the Fresh Prince, looking around, seeing who's left. They can't afford to trade up a ton because they need the picks to fill out their roster. Meanwhile, the Kansas City Chiefs are sitting there with a bunch of picks at 32, and the Chiefs love trading up in the draft. They that they they are all about trading up in the draft. Do it almost every year. They need a wide receiver too. Bills are one of their top competitions. The Bengals also sitting there at 18, one of their biggest competitions in the AFC who could use a receiver. I think the Chiefs get aggressive, move up, take Brian Thomas. I'm not super worried about the Bills getting Brian Thomas, but um, if the Patriots feel like they want a receiver, Yes, you probably do need to jump the bills to get that guy. I look at 26 with Tampa. Tampa's got a bunch of needs. They don't have a ton of salary cap space. They're in a prime spot to move back. 34, 102, 180 probably gets you up to 26. You're now one spot ahead of the bills. Maybe it's A.D. Mitchell. Maybe it's Xavier Worthy. Um, I could see a move like that. But I, I think Brian Thomas will be off the board by that point. I agree. He also speaks to this um, interesting dynamic of kind of a uh, push and pull with the receiving court, yeah. right? Like the depth of the receiving class is going to incentivize some teams to say, we can wait. We'll just go to the second round. Right. Others will see that as Brian Thomas is a legit 20, top 20 prospect, like you just described him. He's the last of that kind because A.D. Mitchell's got questions and Xavier Worthy's like an unprecedented prospect in the good way. His raw speed, 4-2 record-setting speed. I don't know if you missed any tweets from Adam Schefter and Ian Rappaport, national reporters, who insist on reminding us every single time that Xavier Worthy broke the combine record for 40-yard dash uh, because he did. But there are questions there, too. Brian Thomas, right. it's not like he's a perfect prospect, but it's, it's an interesting case study where you could grade him in a vacuum or within the entirety of the receiver class. To answer the question, though, to K yeah. the God, uh, first-time questioner, mailbag, whatever I said, is to say no, or to say yes, I would be opposed to this. For yeah. points that you referenced, you have to go very far up in a way that you're sacrificing a ton of draft capital to fill your own roster holes. I also agree, I don't think the Bills make that kind of move because it's not only just you offloaded all that talent. Uh, Josh Allen's cap hit next year is $61 million. Like That was a preemptive right. move to clear space for Josh Allen's increasing cap hit, which again, they can finagle and move around, but they need to hit on draft picks to have players and players who are cost controlled. So sit tight, Lab McConkey, Ricky Pearsall, any of the receivers we just talked about, you can hit on those. And so I would say just sit tight. Don't worry about the bills. All right. He has been Alex Barth, the 98.5, the sports hub, hopefully taking a long nap this weekend. We got the Celtics coming up. We got the Bruins coming up. And oh, by the way, the draft is on Thursday, which these yeah. are the longest days of the year. Um, but you have made the last couple of weeks and months for a lot of people listening to your station, reading online, 
on Twitter a lot more enjoyable and informative. And uh, I want to thank you for that and especially sharing your insight and information here today. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate having me. This was a ton of fun. Awesome. All right. Well, you go have yourself a beer and a nap. This is a Friday. We will be back on Tuesday. And then again on Friday after the Patriots make their pick and a more regularly scheduled uh, pass interference podcast. If you have not, give us a review, a rating, and subscribe to the new YouTube channel at underscore Andrew Callian. Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend.